Scotland. It's a land enveloped in the mist of legend and the rugged beauty of the highlands that has long captivated the global imagination. Known around the world for the cacophonous beauty of bagpipes, the mysterious Loch Ness, and the home of clans full of brave-hearted warriors. Beneath this romantic veneer lies a societal fabric far more intricate and fascinating than the common stereotypes suggest. For, as Winston Churchill himself once said to encapsulate this complexity, of all the small nations of this earth, perhaps only the ancient Greeks surpassed the Scots in their contribution to mankind. But at the heart of Scotland's remarkable journey is its unique social hierarchy, first forged in the clan system and further branching out through history to create a unique tapestry of family alliances and rivalries that have shaped the nation's character. In today's episode, we shall embark on an exploration through Scotland's storied past, all the way up to its modern social class hierarchy, from the valiant clans perched in the rugged highlands to the vibrant commoners in bustling lowland towns. And along the ride, we'll soon discover that Scotland is more than just an enigmatic land at the top of the British Isles. It stands as a resounding cultural powerhouse firmly set in the centre of human ingenuity. In the rugged expanse of early Scotland, a rich collage of cultures, including the Britons, Picts, Angles, Gaels and Norse, melded together by 800 AD. This intricate ethnic and social mosaic formed the foundation of Scottish society, and indeed one that was distinctly different from any modern forms of social categorization. Now, at the heart of this ancient society were the clans, each a robust and complex entity. And these clans were led by chieftains, figures of authority and respect, who not only governed their people's affairs, but also served as the linchpin in decision-making processes. Leadership within these clans was typically hereditary, often passed down to the eldest son or the nearest male kin, closely resembling a monarchical succession. Furthermore, within the broad umbrella of a clan were smaller factions known as septs. These septs consisted of individuals linked to the clan by bonds of marriage, adoption or other affiliations, creating a web of familial and social connections. And each sept was steered by someone called a taxman, the man responsible for the stewardship of the clan's lands. Specifically, these taxmen often received substantial tracts of land from the clan chief, usually as recompense for their military allegiance. But the dynamic among clans was far from merely confrontational. They often engaged in intricate diplomacy, forging alliances and crafting treaties that mutually benefited their interests. And the more influential clans, such as the formidable clan Campbell of Argyll and the storied clan MacGregor of Glenlochy and Glenstrae extended their influence beyond their borders, engaging with the pillars of Scottish society, the monarchy and the church. For example, clan MacGregor, boasting a Gaelic motto translating to Royal is my race, is believed to trace its noble lineage back to the legendary Kenneth MacAlpin, the unifier and first king of Scotland. Conversely, the chief of Clan Campbell would ascend to the esteemed title of the Duke of Argyll, cementing their high status in Scottish history. Now, by the 10th century, the nation was christened Scotland, a name derived from the Latin term for the Gaels. Following the pivotal Battle of Hastings in 1066, a wave of Anglo-Saxon settlers flowed into the Scottish lowlands, weaving English customs into the Scottish societal fabric and a period that heralded the rise of a structured medieval aristocracy. Quite naturally, at its zenith was the king, under whom rural lairds and urban burgesses wielded power, and beneath them, bonnet lairds or yeomen stood on par with the merchants of larger settlements, and the social hierarchy further extended downwards to include husbandmen, craftsmen, cotters, workers and labourers. Then, at the very base of this societal structure, were the vagrants or masterless men often overlooked, yet pivotal in the historical narrative. But it was not until the year 1707, amidst a backdrop of evolving customs and socio-political structures, that Scotland and England were irrevocably bound together under the banner of the United Kingdom, marking a new chapter in the chronicles of history. This union would form the beginnings of the more modern British identity around social class throughout the entire island that we're familiar with today and will give us our next jumping off point in Scottish social class at the top of the 18th century. 
In the winding journey towards the historic union of Scotland and England in 1707, forming the United Kingdom, Scotland's tumultuous past was marked by numerous wars of independence, immortalized in countless Hollywood films such as Braveheart and Rob Roy. Even today, the issue of Scottish independence continues to stir passionate debates, with the 2014 referendum nearly restoring Scotland's sovereignty. Furthermore, from a social class perspective, the British election study revealed that support for independence was notably higher among supervisors, small business owners and routine workers, such as assembly line workers and cleaners. Conversely, intermediate workers and senior managers showed lesser inclination towards independence. Yet, there are myriad untold stories that shaped Scotland's social landscape. Among these, the role of the lairds, the rural land barons of Scotland, stands prominent. You see, as the 19th century dawned, Scotland experienced the profound upheaval of the highland clearances. The lairds, akin to modern clan chiefs, realized that sheep farming was more profitable than the traditional tenant farming, and consequently, they initiated a brutal campaign of eviction, uprooting farmers from their ancestral lands. Homes were burned, and the once bustling highland townships were left in ruins, a grim testament to unchecked greed. Additionally, this dark era catalyzed rural depopulation and triggered a wave of mass emigration. Shockingly, approximately 70,000 Highlanders and Islanders, stripped of their lands over a century, sought new lives in distant lands like Australia, Canada, the United States, and New Zealand. Among these migrants, the so-called Scots-Irish, a significant have a rich history in the United States, with over 250,000 Scots-Irish arriving in America in the 18th century. They quickly spread inland, settling along rivers and staking claims on land, with a presence was so significant that the Scots-Irish have significantly influenced the US presidency. Surprisingly, a whopping 17 out of 46 US presidents boast some Scots-Irish ancestry, including Andrew Jackson, Ulysses S. Grant, both Bush presidents, and Teddy Roosevelt. Now, at this time, other Scots simply migrated to Scotland's burgeoning urban centres such as Glasgow, Edinburgh, Dundee and Aberdeen. However, to this day, a considerable portion of Scotland's land still remains under the control of aristocratic descendants and wealthy magnates. For instance, Scottish actress Tilda Swinton comes from an ancient Anglo-Scots family with a lineage dating back to the Middle Ages and the billionaire Bucklew family, tracing its origins to the Scottish borders and holding lands for centuries, still remains one of Scotland's richest and most prominent aristocratic families. This ownership pattern echoes the historical dominance of a privileged few over Scotland's landscapes and resources. But even as thousands of Scots clambered aboard vessels to set sail for a new life, the departing Scottish natives wouldn't be the catalyst for a decline in population. For, as while they were departing, the residents of Ireland, the nearby Emerald Isle, who were displaced by famine, soon headed for the country. And the arrival of the Irish in Scotland, despite their shared Celtic heritage, profoundly reshaped the nation, giving rise to a social underclass steeped in sectarianism and workplace discrimination. For example, in 1847, a staggering influx of over 50,000 Irish immigrants swelled the streets of Glasgow. But as the Irish diaspora took root, so too did xenophobia. Case in point, the Glasgow Argus on June 10th of that year alarmingly declared under the headline The Irish Invasion that the streets of Glasgow are at present literally swarming with vagrants from the sister country and the misery which many of these poor creatures endure can scarcely be less than what they have fled or been driven from at home. Many of them are absolutely without the means of procuring lodging of even the meanest description, and are obliged consequently to make their bed frequently with a stone for a pillow. Furthermore, most Irish immigrants who arrived before 1880 were Catholic, arriving in a predominantly Protestant Scotland. This religious disparity bred deep-rooted bigotry, seeping into every facet of daily life and employment. For instance, Catholic immigrants often found themselves confined to unskilled labor, if employed at all. Conversely, Irish immigrants from the predominantly Protestant Northern Ireland, already skilled in heavy industry, quickly found corresponding employment in Scotland. Indeed, Tom Devine, a historian at the University of Edinburgh, reflecting on this era of discrimination, shared his personal recollections. Among my own family in a Lanarkshire town in the 1950s, it was accepted that 
discriminatory employment practices against Catholics were endemic in the local steel industry, the police, banking, and even some high street shops. He further noted that until the 1960s, in some Clyde shipyards, the influence of foremen with Orange and Masonic affiliations who had the power to hire and fire often impeded Catholics from securing apprenticeships. Thus, this tumultuous period in Scottish history, marked by the arrival of the Irish and the resultant societal upheaval, paints a picture of a nation grappling with its identity, as it welcomed new inhabitants who brought with them a complex web of cultural and religious differences, forever altering the social and economic landscape of Scotland. Indeed, as we'll see in the next chapter, these, what we might call socio-religious divisions, even seep down to the realms of entertainment and sport. Now, in the heart of Scotland, sectarianism persists as a deeply ingrained issue, most visibly manifested in the rivalry between Glasgow's two main football teams, Rangers and Celtic. Rangers, embraced by Protestants who champion unionism and hold deep allegiance to the royal family, contrast starkly with Celtic. And Celtic, born from the vision of a priest, aligns with Irish republicanism, harboring sympathies towards left-wing causes and Scottish independence. Now, to outsiders, this rivalry might seem trivial, but for those who have lived or spent considerable time in Western Scotland, the divide between the blue of Rangers and the green of Celtic resonates profoundly, cutting across both working and middle-class communities. Turning to the industrial heart of Scotland, the Clyde shipyards in Glasgow, along with Paisley's textile mills that birthed the renowned Paisley pattern, Dundee's jute industry, and Motherwell's steel mills, heralded the rise of an upwardly mobile working class. This era was marked by robust trade unionism, relentlessly championing improved conditions for workers. However, this golden age of industry was not to last. Between 1960 and 1975, Scotland witnessed the staggering loss of 10,000 manufacturing jobs annually, a number that doubled from 1979 to 1987. Women's employment in the textile sector also dwindled, leaving a lasting impact on the nation's economic landscape. Amidst this decline, a glimmer of hope emerged in 1970 with the discovery of oil in the North Sea off Aberdeen's coast. This discovery transformed the Northeast, ushering in unprecedented prosperity and leading to a population surge of over 40,000 within just 11 years. As the 1980s dawned, the relentless march of deindustrialization continued to ravage Scotland's working class. Andy Clark of Newcastle, in his exploration of this era, noted, throughout the first half of the 80s, 613 manufacturing sites closed across Scotland, leading to the loss of 164,000 jobs. This wave of closures unleashed a torrent of unemployment, poverty and deprivation, especially in towns like Greenock, historically reliant on shipbuilding, sugar refinery and textiles. By 1986, Greenock's grim reality was reflected in the staggering ratio of 43 unemployed individuals for every job vacancy, a symbol of the decades-long contraction of the manufacturing sector. However, now that the historical context has been set, we can properly explore the social structure of modern-day Scotland, giving an easy-to-follow pecking order, for better or worse, as it were. In the contemporary hierarchy of Scottish society, the echoes of its clan-based past resonate, particularly in land ownership. Indeed, despite centuries of change, a significant portion of Scotland's land remains under the control of an aristocratic few. A striking revelation from 1872 highlighted this disparity. A mere 1,380 private landowners held sway over 90% of Scotland's sprawling 7.9 million hectares. Fast forward to the present, and this concentration of land ownership has become, shockingly, even more pronounced. Today, less than 500 individuals command more than half of Scotland's private land. For example, the Scottish Government reports that 57% of rural land is privately owned, with about 12.5% in public hands, 3% under community ownership, and the remainder split between charities and third sector organisations. And among these landowners, the aforementioned Duke of Bucklew, Richard Scott, stands as a towering figure. Owning 200,000 acres, primarily in southern Scotland, 
he remains a prominent landholder even after efforts to reduce his holdings. In recent times, his supremacy has only been challenged by Anders Holchpovelsen, a Danish clothing magnate who owns 220,000 acres across 12 estates in Sutherland and the Grampian Mountains. Turning to the urban landscape, a distinct stratification is evident, with a clear demarcation between the middle class, working class, and a growing underclass grappling with deprivation. Certainly, the scars of industrialization linger, profoundly impacting the populace. As of 2023, Inverclyde, with Greenock as its central city, was marked as Scotland's most deprived area, with alarming rates of income and employment deprivation. A staggering report in the same year revealed that over one million Scots live in poverty, nearly half of whom suffer in extreme poverty. And with a population of 5.4 million as per the 2022 census, these figures represent a significant segment of Scottish society. You see, historically, Scotland witnessed a degree of social mobility, with about a third of its population originating from working-class backgrounds, but in 2001, nearly two-thirds of adults had transitioned to a different social class from their upbringing, with a majority climbing the social ladder. However, sadly, these trends have shifted. The rate of social mobility has declined, and a growing number of individuals remain within the same social class as their parents. Surprisingly, this trend is partially attributed to a decrease in the number of people born into families engaged in traditional working-class occupations, reflecting a transformation in Scotland's socio-economic landscape. And consequently, more children are born into what is a lower middle-class upbringing, or an upper-middle-class lifestyle. Furthermore, approximately 70% of the nation's populace resides in the Central Belt, a vibrant and diverse region that hosts Glasgow, its largest city, and Edinburgh, the esteemed capital since the era of King James IV. And this area is a melting pot of dialects and cultures. The robust working-class Glaswegian accent, made globally recognisable by figures like Billy Connolly, contrasts sharply with the refined Scottish English of Edinburgh's middle class, often perceived as posh. This region also resonates with the broader Scots dialect, prominently showcased in films like Train Spotting. Interestingly, Scots with traditionally working class accents express less concern about dialect based discrimination compared to their counterparts in northern English cities such as Manchester, Liverpool, or Newcastle. And beyond Glasgow and Edinburgh, the Central Belt encompasses significant settlements like Paisley, Stirling, Falkirk, Perth, and Dundee, each with its unique accent. Notably, Dundee itself has seen a surge in notoriety over the last few years as being both the fictional birthplace of the iconic Logan Roy character of HBO's Succession television series and the actual birthplace of the man who played him, Scottish actor Brian Cox. Now, in Glasgow, home to 600,000 people, a significant 16% of Scotland's jobs are concentrated. The energy sector, spearheaded by companies like Scottish Power and SSE, offers many of the region's highest paying positions. And engineering, a nod to Glasgow's industrial heritage, continues to thrive with firms like BAE Systems, Howdens and Thales, providing over 10,000 jobs. The city is also a hub for the financial and creative industries, hosting giants like JP Morgan, Santander, the BBC and STV. Specifically, the aspirational heart of Glasgow's middle class has traditionally been its West End, with neighbourhoods like Hindland highly coveted. However, a wave of gentrification has swept through the city, transforming areas like the South Side, Finiston, and even the East End's Denistoon into trendy enclaves for working professionals, subsequently driving up property prices. In contrast, Glasgow's working class and lower middle class predominantly engage in retail, service industries, and roles within local authorities. And the gentrification of traditionally working-class neighbourhoods has led to increasingly socially mixed communities. Affluent tenements now stand side by side with council-subsidised housing in areas like Partick, Hillhead and Shettleston, painting a vivid picture of a city in the throes of social and economic transformation. This dynamic interplay of class and culture reflects the ongoing evolution of Scotland's social fabric, a fascinating blend of history and modernity. 
In terms of the nation's capital city, Edinburgh, both its civil service and financial industry are two of its major centres of employment. As the nation's second largest financial centre after London, Edinburgh's finance sector employs over 34,000 individuals, many of whom are among the city's highest earners. But the public sector too encompasses a wide array of professions. The National Health Service stands as the largest employer in the region, yet the salaries within it vary dramatically. Consequently, a surgeon is more likely to reside in affluent areas like Murrayfield or Newtown West, where average house prices soar above £500,000, while a nurse might find a home in more modest neighbourhoods such as Muirhouse, Granton or Nidri. And Leith, Edinburgh's historic port, mirrors Glasgow's south side in its experience of gentrification. Property prices in Leith have soared, with one-bedroom flats selling for an average of £228,000, a staggering 43.5% increase from the previous year. And amidst rising poverty and the uncertainties brought by Brexit, scholars are delving into strategies to bridge the widening divide between Scotland's wealthiest and its poorest citizens. Gwilym Price, Professor of Urban Economics and Social Statistics at the University of Glasgow, emphasises the complexity of this challenge. He argues that reducing inequality transcends merely increasing taxes on the wealthy, and there is a profound geographical aspect to poverty and inequality that demands comprehensive and coordinated efforts to mitigate disparities in education quality, employment access, and exposure to risks like crime and pollution across cities and neighbourhoods. Psychologist Suzanne Zedick from the University of Dundee, on the other hand, points to the importance of open dialogue in addressing social class disparities. She suggests that building trust is crucial, though not straightforward, in tackling inequality. Inequality breeds distrust and division, leaving people feeling unheard and insignificant, fueling anxiety, anger and suspicion. Looking towards 2030 and beyond, the narrative of social class indeed remains central to understanding Scotland. A minority upper class continues to possess a significant portion of the nation's land, and the middle class, while stable, is firmly entrenched. But the underclass, bearing the brunt of deindustrialization's lingering effects, struggles to stay afloat. This complex social landscape with its stark contrasts and ongoing challenges, paints a vivid picture of a nation grappling with the legacy of its past while navigating the uncertainties of its future. And now, we'd love to see you in the comments. Are you a native Scot or have some Scottish heritage? We'd love to hear your personal thoughts on social class in Scotland. And, as always, we appreciate your continued viewership with us here at Old Money Luxury. Cheers, until next time.